Our scripture lesson this morning comes from uh, the First John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. It's on the screen behind me. It's also in your worship folder. If you would join me in reading this morning's scripture, I believe that there's strength and there's power in the word of God. It has that opportunity to reach into our hearts and reach into a, our, our being and touches our spirit in such a way that, that we're able to connect with God, we're able to connect with what he's saying, and it begins a great change within us. It's that start for transformation, that start for uh, becoming that new creature that God has created. So if you would join me in reading the scripture. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves as Christ is pure, just as he is pure, sorry. Will you bow with me for a, a moment of prayer? Gracious God, and, and gracious is a, a wonderful word to describe you, Father. Gracious in the sense that you move with elegance and that you move uh, beautifully. And you move at the right moment and at the right time. And Lord, when you move, it isn't uh, a forced movement. You've already been orchestrating so many things in our life. And as we see that grace, that, that gracious movement in our life, that, that unearned movement, that unearned love, we thank you that we have this time to look at your word, to see your graciousness in the midst of it. And as that word begins to enter into our hearts and into our souls and deep within us, may it continue to do, may it continue to orchestrate our life that we will grow deeper in our understanding of who you are, that we may grow deeper in that relationship of love that you have given to us, that we may truly be called your child and to understand what that means. In your name, amen. Amen. We've been talking about uh, the sermon that John Wesley preached and, and shared with us. He preached this about 1733. And, and this sermon was called The Circumcision of the Heart. And, and as we looked at the idea of the circumcision of the heart, we we, we have an idea what circumcision is, but as, as John Wesley was describing this movement, this circumcised heart, what he was saying is a, a heart that sin has been sliced off of. A, a, a heart that's been sliced open by that grace, that love, that forgiveness that God brings, and that forgiveness that God opens, into, opens us up to. And, and, and as that heart has been sliced uh, John Wesley said there's four things that come out of that, uh, four things, four attributes that are seen in, in a mighty way in that opened heart. There's a, a deep humility, uh, and that, that C.S. Lewis gave us a really good understanding of that, that deep humility. That true humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking, yourself, thinking of yourself less. So it's meaning that I am not the center of the world. I am not at the center of everything. And, and as John Wesley would bring that in, he said that God is at the center. That, that God is the one who becomes the Lord of our life, becomes the, the place where we operate out of. Not meeting my needs, but seeing the love of the Father being poured out upon me and, and how that, that as God at the center begins to open up new opportunities and more new avenues for me to travel down. The, the second was a steadfast faith. And, and this came out of John Wesley's sermon. This is a, a quote from the circumcision of the heart. 
we are not his disciples while we either deny him to be the author or his spirit to be the inspirer and perfecter both of our faith and works. And, and, and I know it seems a little heavy, and, and I, I've mentioned it before, and I'll mention it again. John Wesley doesn't mince his words. He, he kind of smacks you upside the head and says, here it is. And, and, and the steadfast faith that he's talking about, this, this uh, circumcised heart has this deep humility that, that God is at the center, that has this faith, this faith that doesn't deny God, that doesn't deny Jesus, doesn't deny that God is the beginning of that faith, doesn't deny that, that the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, is the, uh, is the perfecter and inspirer of that faith. Meaning that as we go out into the world, as we go, out, as we go on with the rest of our life, that at the center is God, and as, as God continues to be at that center, God begins to shape our faith, and it's uh, something that we can grasp onto and hold onto through all those difficult days. Because they, we don't have an easy life. We don't have a moment where, where we can kind of just like, oh, yeah, that's great. This is the way it's supposed to be. Because just as soon as that happens, then there's another wave that comes over us. And another wave that begins the, us to the hold on to that faith even more. And, and as that steadfast faith begins to grab, as we begin to hold on to our faith with that steadfastness, that perseverance, that, that faith, that, the, the grasp that says, I will see this through, we, we come to this third aspect of this circumcised heart, which is a lively hope. And John Wesley shared these words in, in that circumcision of the heart, heart sermon. Those who are thus by faith born of God have also strong consolation through hope. And, and, and as John Wesley was, was sharing this piece of it, that, that strong consolation is, is something we may need to, to hold on to. Because there's going to, just said that with steadfast faith, there's that moment where things get hard. And we can let the hardness of that begin to overcome us and the hardness of that to, to weigh us down. But there's something else about that faith. There's something else about having God at the center of our heart, the God at the center of our life that begins to change us and begins to open up a new door for us that all of a sudden we're not seeing the dark and despair. But when we see something different, we see something that we can grasp onto. We see, we see hope. Have you ever been around a hopeless person? Someone that's given up that anything will ever change? It's not a pretty sight. I, I, I listen to, uh, well, I, I kind of watch sports a lot more than I watch anything else or listen to anything else. And, and, and as you ever... <laughs> When the Pirates went through their 19 years of losing, uh, Greg Brown was always one of those people. He's the announcer for the Pirates. He was always one of those people I'd like to listen to, especially as it got down to the end of the season. And, and you can just hear it in his voice where he'd say, all right, we're in another season, and uh, yep, we're not going to make it to 81 games again this year. And so uh, he'd always try to bring back hope. There's always something about next year. There's always that, that the opening day that's going to happen, and we'll all have that hope again that we'll make it through a, a season and be at the 82 win mark, getting rid of or not being in that losing side of things. But as a, uh, and if you're a Cubs fan, I'm sure you, you can feel that same being right now as this is the year the Cubs win the World Series. Maybe. Uh, but there's that hope. There's that something to look forward to. There's that something that we have a picture of. And in this first John, John's letter here, the chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, we begin to see our, our, what our hope is in. And it's a lively hope. It begins with this, this, what is this hope that we have? It begins that, that it's the God's love that's lavished upon us. Yeah, basis of our hope. The first one is the God's love that's lavished upon us. The love God has given us. You got to think about that for a minute. Let that sink in. That, that God has looked in your heart and God has looked at your life and God has looked at you since, since you were, even before you were knee-high to a grasshopper in the old days, the old sayings, and said, 
I love you. I love you. And I am pouring out a love upon you that is so great and so grand that there's nothing that's going to take it away from you. There's nothing that's going to remove my love from you. And, and, and this hope that as we put Jesus or God, as we put God at the center of it, and, and we see that faith that we trust in God, we begin to see that God's hope, God's love, has always been there. It has not left us. And, and as God's love is being poured out upon us, and then we have this next hope that, that we respond to, this, to God's love, we begin the, the next part to see that our, our hope is based on us being a child of God. And, and maybe you need to take that for a moment and, and look to the person to your left or right, or if no one's sitting on either side, maybe person in front of you or behind you, look at them and tell them that they are a child of God. Go ahead. <laughs> you may think that those are, are little words. But, but let that be for a moment. We, we have a couple different children around the room still. And, and you look at the mothers and the parents and the grandparents holding those children. And you know that that child belongs. And, and as we think about that for a moment... We may not see God's arms wrapped around us, but that the hope that we ha have is based on God's arms scooping us up and saying, you are my child. You are my son. You are my daughter. And I love you. That is that lively hope that we carry within us. That is that lively hope that, that begins to swell up within us. And, and as we let that settle into our mind and into our heart, our heart begins to change. Because it's no longer dependent upon the outside forces of my life. It's not dependent upon my job. It's not dependent upon my family, my spouse. It's not dependent upon my family. Or, yeah, I said that, my family. It's not dependent upon how the political system is working or how the justice system is working. It's based upon God's love for me. That is where my hope lies. God's love that says, I am a child. So what is our hope? What is it that, that our, our, our hope is? Our hope is that we will be like Jesus. That, that remember, we are that child of God. We are that child who, who God has looked at and calls us by name. He does, God has another son. A son that, that, as we look through the New Testament, and, we, and even in the Old Testament, we don't hear about the son, but we see the fingers being pointed to the son. The son of God, who died to bring us in forgiveness, who died so that we may understand what forgiveness is. And, and, and as we, what is our hope? Our hope is that we, ha we will be like Jesus, and we will forgive we will be forgiven. We understand what forgiveness is because as we look at our life, we see all the things that are in our life. We see all that ugliness and, and the broken relationships and the hurts that have been caused and the pain that continues on because of words or actions, because of, of shall I say the word, sin, disobedience to God. And, and our hope, what is our hope? Our hope is that we will be forgiven. And not only we, that our hope is there, but our hope can, continues on as we are like Christ, that we will be able to forgive others. That we won't hold these grudges, 
that we won't hold this pain and this agony and let this bitterness continue to grow in our heart because our heart will get hardened and we will miss out on that hope again because we won't understand what it is to be that child of God because we will let go of that hope and we will hold on to that hurt and that anger and that bitterness and we will not let that love go out. We have this lively hope that continues to bring us back to the foot of the cross. We have this lively hope, hope that brings us back to that moment that as we kneel on our, as we get down on our knees and we ask for forgiveness, that it is given to us. This lively hope opens that doorway to let forgiveness flow. That we will be like Christ. And we will see him as he is. And as this hope continues to be a part of our life, there are, there are a couple of things that, that this hope brings to us. Not just forgiveness and not just an open heart, but it's an anchor. It's an anchor in the storm of life. It's an anchor that says that, that, you know what, the world is crashing upon me and I hear the words and I see the actions of others and, and I just don't understand what, why God is doing what God is doing. And, and then we begin to look and see that God's love is lavished upon us, that we are a child of God, and, and that anything that comes against us, that we have this hope that will see us through. This hope that says that God hasn't left me, that Jesus hasn't got, just dropped me off the face of the earth. That God's spirit is interweaving in this. I, I used the word orchestrating in my opening prayer, and, and, and now I see why God was doing that, to talk about orchestrating. That he just brings that back in. That that pain and that anguish and that heartache and that hurt that continues to build up and, and, and it seems like we're hopeless that the, the end of the season is here, the end of life is near and I have nothing to show for it. But God says, you do. You have me. And I love you and you are my daughter. You are my son. And that is the hope that we hold on to. That when Jesus is revealed, that we shall see him as he is, and that we will know him. And we don't believe this because it's a, that, that we don't, we have this hope not because it's a, a vain hope, but it's a true hope. It's a true hope that we hold on to. It's, it's not something that some fairy tale that there's as a magical kingdom as Disney would let us believe. And as we look at God's word, Jesus says over again, this is the kingdom of God that's here and now. And there's a kingdom of God that will be coming. There's a place that I have for you. I go prepare a table for you. And if I prepare a table for you, I will come back so that you will be with me, Jesus says in the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 6, if you really want to look it up. Jesus hasn't left us. And this hope that we carry, this hope that we have, this lively hope that begins to infiltrate our heart and, and our mind and our soul begins to say that there is something out there. There's something better waiting for me. And it's something I can grasp on. It's something I can hold on to. Why? Because my heart has been changed. I have this deep humility. I am not the center of my life. And if I'm not the center of my life, then, then I have this faith in someone else, this faith that will see me through. And if I have this faith, there is a lively hope that I can hold on to, that there is a better tomorrow. There is a better today. There is forgiveness for me. There is forgiveness for others, that I am that child of God. And I am not living my life as if there's nothing else out there. That it's all for me. Because it's not. It's for my Savior. And as I live my life for my Savior, then I will be pure as Christ is pure. That I will have this, verse 3 tells us that, that we will have this hope that we will, uh, that, let me say it because I, John puts it so much better than I do. That we who have this hope will be pure just as he is pure. That those who have this hope in Christ will be like Christ. Doesn't mean that, that we won't be without sin because we're not Jesus. 
It says we will be like Jesus. But we will be pure in our love. We will be pure in our forgiveness. We will have a pure heart. We will have a, a new life, be a new creature, be a new person, be a transformed person. Because we are being purified. That dross, uh, and I think it's Peter who talks about the fire, the consuming fire that burns away the dross, that burns away all the, the extra, that gets us back down to the center of our heart, gets burned away. Because our minds are changed, our hearts are changed. And we become, we become pure. Pure in our love pure in our motive, pure in our understanding, pure in our forgiveness. We may not be sinless, but we will sin less because we are seeing people through the eyes of Christ, through the eyes of God, seeing them as people of worth, seeing them as a child of God, seeing them as people that understand forgiveness, need forgiveness, just like us. I think when John Wesley was talking about the circumcision of the heart and back in 1733, I said this before, this is before he had his experience, uh, uh, his assurance, if we want to put it that way, his experience at Aldersgate where he felt his heart strangely warmed and all these lessons that he'd been teaching up until that point finally began to gel together and make sense. I mentioned it last week, one of his, his uh, uh, another quote that John Wesley gave in a different sermon and a different interview with a different person was you, he would tell his preachers to preach faith until they have it and then preach it even more. And he said that for a reason because that's, what he, that's how he lived his life. He preached his faith till he found it and then as he found it, he preached it even more. And this hope... We're living in a time of turmoil and a time of, of a lot of things coming together. Maybe we need to live in this hope and understand what this hope is and teach this hope so that others can have hope. That others can understand what this circumcised heart looks like as you and I go and live it out. So what are you going to do with this hope? Well, maybe I shouldn't even ask that question. Maybe I should back up a minute. Do you have this hope? Do you understand what this hope is and what it means? And if you, if you haven't, uh, come talk to someone. Come talk to me. I'll talk to you. I try to talk to everybody, but sometimes I, I don't do as well as I'd like to. Find someone else in that faith is, uh, that has this strong faith, that has this hope. Ask them what it means. Ask them what it is. And then as you find this hope, share it with someone else. And don't be surprised if it takes a while for that to sink in. Because they've been living a long time without any hope. And here's an opportunity to show them your hope. And let them catch it and grow in it.